Welcome back to Professor Sky's Creating a Hip Hop Class. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making this class and it's about hip hop culture, but mostly about rap music. And I'm now moving on to, basically I have a month to go, a month and a day until the class starts. And, you know, I know everything that I want to teach and I basically know the format, but there's so much missing. And I want to take you on the journey with me. I'm now on break. I just gave all my finals. I still have to grade them and all that. And I still have to prepare my other class, but still, you know, this is what's going to be taking up my time during my break. And so I'm, I've already done a couple of videos in this series, sort of showing you how I'm going about it, how I created a syllabus, uh, but it's evolving. And so it might be fun for you, interesting for you to see how a professor goes about trying to do something like this. So today's video is going to be in two, two sections. <clears throat> the first section will be me evolving the syllabus sort of explaining to you how I'm chunking out the time because much like music, a lot of teaching is time management. Uh, like trying to, you know, you only have so many face hours with a student. You only have so much homework you can assign them. How do you maximize that for best learning? Um, and then, you know, the other, the other part is going to be talking about Wrath Capital and Atlanta story by Joe Coscarelli. <clears throat> how am I going to use this book to teach about Atlanta? How am I even going to explain Atlanta? How am I, someone who grew up with a huge East Coast bias, with a little bit of West Coast appreciation, but definitely an anti-South bias is something that I possess and then I have to get over, you know, how is this book going to help me? How is it going to help my students who are all mostly from the Northeast? You know, this, this will be an interesting experiment. Uh, you know, how does this book work? How does it not work? How am I going to supplement the information? So uh, if you want to just skip to that part where I talk about Atlanta, uh, look down in the description. Uh, I'll change it and I'll move around. Sorry, my dog is barking. You're going to get a lot of that in this video. Hey, Toby, Toby, we'll talk about Atlanta rap in a second. But now let me sort of take you through what, what I was doing this morning. So uh, this is, uh, I'm working sort of on this idea of a, um, of a grid, right? So this is the deal. I teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And the first class is on a Friday. I have one week off, you know, that's spring break. Woo, freak Nick. And then the the one day off for what's called Scholars Day. Now, I do not represent my college in any way, okay? On this video, I am just explaining sort of in theory. <laughs> I'm giving you the details, but I do not represent the college where I teach. So I'm not even going to say their name. Okay. But this is what I did this morning. You know, my, my baby was there. I have like a little pen over there where the baby lays down on the ground. It was laying down on the ground. It was cooing. It was burping. It was pooping. It was doing all the stuff that babies do. And I'm sitting there and I'm trying to figure out how do I teach this class? How do I chunk it out? So I actually had to write out the exact number of classes that I have. So the first day of classes, that has to be an intro. Can't have homework. Okay. I know I'm going to have a midterm exam, a full 50 minute exam halfway through to make sure they're following. Then I put that on a Wednesday. <laughs> instead of on a Friday. Let me tell you why. Because I have a lot of students who live uh, in New York City and I teach about seven hours away from New York City. So probably students are gonna be leaving on that Friday. So instead of having to reschedule this or that, I'm gonna make that Friday a little bit less high stakes, okay? Uh, then Monday we get back and then the last week is supposed to be review, you know, not new material and I'm gonna have the students give presentations. So I figured out I have 40 total classes. God, I hope I have some coffee in here. I do. That was dramatic. You know, so then if you keep looking down here, I sort of figured it out that there's five classes that are going to be taken up by review, revision, by Scholars Day, and by the intro. So that means I have 35 classes where I can teach new material, 50 straight minutes of new material. 35 classes, which means 35 individual classes. I plan on having two songs per class, which will probably take six minutes, six to 10 minutes, depending on how long the songs are. So I got 40 minutes of instruction. So I'm gonna have to create PowerPoints. I'm gonna have to make sure they have enough homework to back up there. Okay. So this is as of now, as of December 19th, holy crap, my class starts on, <laughs> on January uh, 20th. Uh, the, this is the units that I'm perceiving. So basically I'm chunking it into units of a week by week, right? So if there's 35 classes, then that'll be 30 classes, you know, so just three per week, and then I'll have extra time. 
So prehistory, that'll be a week. Hip hop culture, like that means like graffiti and dance. That'll be another week. Old school New York, I'll call that a week. New school New York, I'll call that four classes plus an extra class for international rap. And then we'll get into LA gangster rap. That's going to be one whole week plus an extra class, probably just for Tupac. Then a week of Atlanta, which I'm going to get into soon. Then a week for Houston and New Orleans. Okay. Then at least four classes on women in hip hop. And then Ye and Drake. I think that's how I'm going to basically describe uh, the last 20 years is through Ye and Drake. And then a week on the current state of hip hop, the internet and hip hop and local hip hop. I live in Western New York. The college where I teach is close to two cities in Western New York. I'm going to show the students that, hey, the, the, the rap is here as well. Okay. So then after realizing all of that, here's how my new syllabus basically chunks out. This is how I perceive of it going. You see here, prehistory, new school New York. So that's going to be, you know, Nas and Jay-Z and Wu-Tang, LA Gangster Rap, Snoop and Dre and Ice-T. Okay, and gangster rap in general. And then Atlanta is going to be after the midterm. So that's this is going to be after the midterm. Uh, and then Houston, New Orleans, uh, women, Drake and Yay, internet, just one day at least of that. That's mostly going to be assignments not from books. It's going to be mostly assignments from the internet. So that's where I am right now. I'm excited. I'm very excited. You're going to notice that Atlanta is in the week after midterms. And that the women's section in here, I've already done a video on how I'm going to be teaching uh, women in hip hop. So like, I have to, <laughs> I have to reprioritize here. I, I'm going to move on to prehistory after this video, because <laughs> when in doubt, go in order. So that's where I am right now. Okay. Um, that's where I am with this class. That's where it appears to be going. And now let's move on to how am I going to teach Atlanta. Okay. How am I going to teach the rap capital? Realistically, Atlanta is the most important city in hip hop right now. Don't get mad. I'm mad. It should be New York forever. Always, 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 always. But Atlanta has stepped through and crushed the buildings. So let's say, how are we going to talk about that with a partial review of this book, Rap Capital by Joe Coscarelli. I'm going to stop the share here. Um, my general thoughts on Rap Capital by Joe Coscarelli. It is a hardbound book. There's Mr. Coscarelli there. Okay. It is a hardbound book, so it's pretty expensive. Um, I do suggest it. You know, like it's a good book. It's a good read. Um, sometimes people's access alters their content. And that, I mean, that always happens. So he had great access to quality control records, uh, the people who produced Migos and who produced Lil Baby. So it's really a book about Migos and Lil Baby. There's like a couple pages on Outcast, a couple pages on Future, basically nothing on Future. So Metro Boomin's name is mentioned like four times. So <laughs> Lil Nas X is a page so that's both both its strength and its weakness. Because if you have a book that is this thick about Atlanta hip hop and Outcast is like three pages, what are they going to be talking about? Right? What's he going to be writing about? So I'm going to take you through the pages that I'm going to scan. So I, my students, I work at a public college, right? I don't represent them, but I work at a public college. Students don't have a lot of money where I work. Most of my students have part time jobs. Never underestimate the impact of part-time jobs on higher education. It is a goddamn travesty. Whenever we talk about college being, oh, college should be free, we always put it in the frame of debt. What about my students? What about my students? Okay, I'm not talking about students who are out there and who are, you know, going to going to Dartmouth and accruing two hundred thousand dollars worth of debt that they have to pay off. I'm talking about my students who go to a state school but still need to work a shift at Applebee's three times a week. Anyways, those are the students who need free college. Political rant. G getting back to smash the like bucket if you like my political rant or if you dislike it, tell me in the comments. But um, so I'm just gonna be scanning certain pages, okay? 
And people have asked me, would you please share with me the reader that you create? No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rip these guys off. There is educational purposes. You are allowed to scan a certain amount of any book that you uh, that you want and share it with students, not for distribution. So that's what I'm going to be doing. In the past, for the last couple of books I've done, I've shown you the questions that I've written, but I've decided not to do that right now. I think I need to focus on questions later and scanning now. Like I need to have a clear picture of what I'm going to be demanding of students in general before I get specific with the questions. Basically, I'm going to scan and then create the questions. Okay, so let's go through this book. Let's go through this very interesting, well-written book, and I'm going to take you to the scans. Okay, so these are the pages that I am planning on scanning. Some of them I'm going to upload. Um, I'm going to, wait, why is my screen sharing pause? Resume share, resume share. Okay, stop share. See, I don't understand Zoom. It always does this to me. It gets all weird. Okay. Share screen. Okay, wrap capital. Good, now I'm screen sharing. Good, awesome. So let's look at this, right? So first of all, um, I have to I have to create an introduction. So for every single, oh, my glasses fell over. For every single class, every single lesson that I teach, I am going to be putting everything in what I call social context. Right. So hip hop is a like all art. Hip hop is a result of certain social conditions, social, cultural, political, financial, societal conditions. Right. And I'm kind of, you know, whenever I teach about fun stuff, it's always a trick, you know, like I'm actually teaching them about the history of America and inequality in America. Like that's sort of the actual subject of the whole class. It's going to be about the power of music to reflect life. It's going to be about the deep meaning of music and how it actually tells us more about our society than reading the newspaper might. Okay, that's that's my little secret agenda. Okay, so um, this does a good job, not a great job, okay, with giving an introduction to Atlanta as a place. Okay, so... Uh, it starts off with this map, which is actually a great map, okay? It includes the location of Magic City, uh, the the former place of Bowen, of Bowen Homes, like where Buckhead is, a whole bunch of like where people are from that are in the book. So that's quite interesting. So I like that quite a bit. Um, it goes on to this interesting idea that there are these... Um, child murders in Atlanta in like the early 80s that really tainted the way uh because there's black kids who are killed the way black kids grew up in Atlanta he doesn't insist on it too much but it's interesting he talks a little bit about Freaknik the the HBCU festival uh spring break which is interesting very two pages on Outcast. so what does that mean I have to find more stuff on Outcast. hey internet People who think I'm doing something cool here, tell me. Tell me what. Tell me what. Did you read an article about Outcast? Tell me about it. Did you read a book about Outcast? Tell me about it. What do you think is the best video that you've seen on the internet about Outcast? As of now, I'm probably going to have them watch this like VH1 <laughs> documentary from like 2003, which is actually fairly good. You know, it's fun. It gives you the information. Um, it's it's a little bit glossy. But part of dealing with popular culture, when you teach popular culture, is a lot of your uh, primary documents are going to be glossy and not academic. It's my job to make them academic, so I will. Um, and it's interesting, this book weaves in between different stories, primarily between Lil Baby and Migos. Lil Baby is everywhere throughout this book. He's on the first page. I think he's on the last page. He's used as a kind of avatar of Atlanta, an example of Atlanta a, like it's not that he's the best it's that he is the perfect representation of an atlanta rapper so when i thought about how am i going to be teaching these three classes on atlanta class number one i'm going to do outcast i'm just going to spend a whole class on outcast i mean their music is so good it's fun it's exciting it's revolutionary we can do lots of great close textual analysis it's going to be super fun right and then i'm going to do an entire thing on trap and migos so all the trap acts we're talking 
little Jeezy and T.I. and Gucci Mane, but with a strong emphasis on Migos for the simple reason that this book does a very good job of explaining the Migos. And then the final one will be Lil Baby, who's very relevant, very popular now still. You know, I mean, his last album didn't hit as hard as it could have, but it's still, you know, one of the most streamed albums of last year, this year, last year, depending on when you watch it. So that's how I'm going to do it. Um, and then <laughs> you're sitting there and this is what happened. I was figuring this all out, right? I was figuring this all out and I was, I was, and my baby was on the ground and I go, what about future? And for some reason that made my, <laughs> made my baby laugh. My four month old baby go, hey, I'm like, yeah, what about future? What about future? If I don't include future, Metro Boomin's not going to trust me. And if Metro Boomin doesn't trust me, uh-oh, <laughs> my baby starts laughing. So anyways, no, that's just my life. That's life of a professor and a new dad. If you think that story's cute, you definitely got to subscribe to this. Who else is who else is talking to his newborn about Metro Boomin potentially not trusting him? So I still don't know what to do with with future. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to squeeze him in with Outcast, give him his own class, throw him into Trap and Migos, maybe split the little baby half with little baby and future. I don't know yet. Um, but again, if you know of any good primary source material about future, about his influence, about his about his style and his story, let me know because there's like two pages in this book about future. Um, so it talks a little bit about Outcast in the Dungeon. One thing I really like about this book is, and, and you can see it here in this weird little uh, drawing that I have here. That I, And by the way, Professor Sky rule number one, write all over your books. Buy books if you can afford them and write all over them. It makes it a lot better. It's a much better reading experience. So this is basically an outline of these major figures, these major like producers not producers in the sense of Metro Boomin, like producing music, but producers in the sense of Puff Daddy, like label owners, creators, executives, right? Who like, there's a whole net worth. So there's Rico Wade who runs the dungeon and that's where Outcast comes from. And that's also ultimately where Future came from. And then they ended up signing to LA Reed. And this book doesn't care too much about LA Reed or about the dungeon, okay? That's not a weakness except that it makes it not a complete portrait of Atlanta rap, which would be to, to there. What it really focuses on are these two characters of P, Pierre Thomas and Coach K. And there's this whole network of rap artists who are together. Like Coach K discovers Jeezy, discovers Gucci Mane, funds the Brick Factory where Young Thug comes from, which then becomes YSL, which then becomes Gunna. Like there's this whole line. And then Coach K and P together form quality control which then sign Migos and Little Baby, right? So like there's this whole network and this book does a good job of describing that. So he talks a little bit about Little Baby's youth. You know, Little Baby, again, as an exemplary story, somebody who grew up, you know, single parent household and crime and all that stuff. Um, a very good section here about uh, BMF, uh, the Black Mafia family that like ran Atlanta, um, I guess it was out of Detroit. It was like a, like a, a gang, <laughs> Big Meech. Have you ever heard him referenced in hip hop that he was a member of that, of that gang? He's still in jail. He's getting out relatively soon. And they ran drugs and they apparently just flooded Atlanta with money and just excess. Um, here, I'm just mentioning, this is a note to myself. If I want to add Gucci Mane and TI, I can. As of now, I'm not really going to be talking about them. I'm going to be focusing on Jeezy. Uh, and Young Thug and Migos, but maybe I'll add them. I can't tell. Um, this is this is where I say for class, not for homeworks. So I'm going to be scanning this and not giving it to the class, just for me, so that I can present to them the story of Coach and P. Because also another thing about the history of hip hop is it is partly a, a history of Black entrepreneurship, um, and that's a very interesting story, right? Um, there's a wonderful description here, Chinese finger trap. And I'm going to read this to you from page uh, 75 of this book, um, which Chinese finger traps are those, uh, if you don't know the metaphor, are those little like things that you put your fingers in and you can't get them out. Like you, the harder you pull, the more your fingers get stuck, right? 
This was a running paradox in rap, a frustrating Chinese finger trap for so many young artists in the 21st century, with every moment potentially documented on social media. Hip hop is seen by so many as a final or only chance to escape downward mobility, poverty, the streets, the mud, the trenches. But it's also an arena that necessitates flexing, showing off, being richer, better dressed, and better appointed than the next guy. In most cases, you need both to have struggled and to have overcome. But as the beginning stages of a rap career, the appearance of overcoming usually overlaps with the end of the struggle. In other words, you can't get it if you aren't already shining to some degree, even if the music you are making is a document of that struggle. It's faking it until you make it taken to the extreme. Yet if you get caught faking it too blatantly, that can call into question everything else you've been saying about your success and your struggles. So it's fascinating, right? The idea of relationship between money and happiness. So I'm going to be, that's, I'm going to take, you know, well, I got 40 minutes. I'm going to take at least five minutes to explain that quote. I'm going to tell my students that's going to be on the final. Okay. There's a whole explanation of the song Versace. So um, actually, I, I want that to be, um, I want song titles to be italicized. Come on, Sky. Uh, so, you know, like I'm I'm trying to think about what songs I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to go over Versace, probably not super deeply, but quickly um, talks about the deal with quality control, how it was founded. Uh, little baby, you see little babies just laced throughout here. I'm, I'm going to put all little baby stuff together in, in one packet. My favorite section of this whole book, by far, one of my favorite things I've ever read in any hip hop book anywhere is a thing is a section where he was a fly on the wall when the Migos wrote a song that doesn't even exist. You can find you can find demos of the song on YouTube called Wide Awake, but he describes how boring it is hanging around. Despite appearances, to hang out with a famous rapper or three can be pretty effing boring. It is a sort of enduring monotony that God willing might be injected with glitz or excitement at any given moment, <clears throat> inflating every phone call or change in plans with pregnant potential. But by the odds of the universe, things tend to stay pretty much as low key as they seem for first. Uh, at first for minutes, then hours at a time. I love this idea that hanging around with rap artists is boring. I've been hanging around with most celebrities is boring. So he describes how Migos slip away. They're supposed to be on some kind of tour. I mean, some kind of like publicity thing, but they go off to a studio and they describe how they write. There is no actual writing going on while Migos writes a song. Their style of rapping, eons away from the old school idea of a guy with a pen and a pad, was learned from their idols like Gucci Mane and Lil Wayne, who freestyled at will. But instead of coming up with lengthy stanzas in their heads and then rapping them in full a la Jay-Z, the Migos members craft songs directly into the microphone. One syllable and then one word and then one phrase and then one line at a time, stopping, starting, and rewinding over and over again. Come on. Did you know that? I mean, it makes sense when you listen to Migos, when you listen to Atlanta rap, that this is the way that it's done. But this is this is a guy who is sitting there watching the song being written and that that's how it works. And of course, of course, as an East Coast rap elitist like I am, I'm not going to like this. I want you to have bars that are carefully written. Instead of more traditional rap storytelling, such improvisational methods lend themselves to capturing bursts of personality, surrealist description, flashes of memory and landscape, and brand names rattling around in rappers' heads. It isn't easy to do, but it can sound like it is, which is to say it sounds cool, effortless, and like them of Atlanta, even when they aren't there physically. So it just describes this whole thing. Like... This guy's working on, they just keep on saying, do it again. And he describes it, right, uh, I got 50K on me, extra, serving fiends, my dog. Yes, sir, ride up, vibe, drop top, you dig, I, 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 riding in on that, drop top. Migos, big dog, chopper, dirty, Kawasaki chopper, it's dirty, 30, 30, that's curry, big dope, ba bass drop, drop top, ain't up, I can't stop, drip wet. It's poetry, right? <laughs> it's just absolute cadavre excuse poetry that's going on here and he just goes through the entire song and we see how they eventually find a chorus just uh, look wide awake take your bay on a date and like pull up on skates 
and when you listen to the actual song the screaming wake up and and uh and wide awake you know it's this full song but the song's never released wonderful wonderful writing helps me totally understand uh, a little spoiler for the future of professor sky's record review i am going to be referencing this quite often when i talk about bursts of personality surrealist descriptions flashes of memory and landscape and brand names rattling around in rappers heads that describes everything that i had a hard time understanding about atlanta hip-hop very good description of the song bad and bougie so that's going to be one of the songs i'm going to spend half a class on bad and bougie i know all my students know it and it's important it's a, it's important drift drop top top flip flop whatever that's actually important right uh, more stuff on the little babies. Uh, whoops. Um, and then the whole. Whoops. Sorry, that's miswritten. Um, the thing that they really emphasize, or that he really emphasizes with little baby, is there an apostrophe? No. Little baby is that he was somebody who really had a hard time getting out of the streets. So when he got started, he came out of jail and he was still dealing drugs and gambling. Apparently, he's really good at dice. I looked up on YouTube how dice actually works. It's interesting. Seems like a terrible way to waste your money, but whatever. Um, but not for Little Baby. He made a lot of money off of it. Uh, and it's really great because this whole book uh, catalogs the internal struggle of a rap artist who wants to make it out. But when you start off in the music business, you got no money. You got nothing. And then if in order to make it, what what's fascinating, what this really... Uh, uh, shows is the way these guys, uh, Coach K and P, the way they would recruit rappers is they wouldn't find talented rappers. They would find charismatic gangsters, charismatic dope boys. Really, that's what they did. Young Jeezy wasn't a rapper. Coach K saw him was like, you're going to be a rapper now. Lil Baby wasn't a rapper. Pierre Thomas was like, you're going to be a rapper now. And that's what they understood. So I'm just happy. I'm happy. I hope you are an East Coast elitist as well, who sees and understands that what we're experiencing here is a different form of hip hop. It's a totally different form of hip hop. It's totally different. It has nothing to do with Biggie sitting in his room, uh, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis. It's none of that. It's people who grew up in a bad situation who only thought, Lil Baby says over and over again, he only looked up to drug dealers. He liked rap, but he only looked up to drug dealers, that that was the goal. And that these music uh, executives, these neophyte executives understood something, which was pay the people for the authenticity. The art will come later. We'll deal with that detail of the art later. And as we know, Lil Baby is a great artist, right? I don't know about Lil, I don't know about Young Jeezy. But but what, what I think is interesting is that now that we're dealing with all these Atlanta rappers who are getting uh, busted on Rico charges, it makes more sense because there isn't that much money in music. There really isn't. And so it makes sense that if you started off because you were a gangster and then you started making money and then it's cyclical, then you don't make the money anymore. You still have the lifestyle of a famous rap star. How are you going to supplement that? Well, you can supplement that with street money. So it makes sense that there's going to be more artists, especially artists who were found this way by, by people like P and Coach K who are going to recidivate and go back to a life of crime because to keep up your lifestyle to have any lifestyle at all, especially when the lifestyle is so extravagant, when you're putting all your friends on the payroll, when you are when you have to buy $100,000 pinky rings in order to be seen as valid in the art form, right? <sighs> so it's it's cool because this book, uh, even though it's new, it wasn't around when, when the YSL gang got arrested. But the reasons why they got arrested are in this book right here. So Lil Baby is used as this example of should I be a trap, a trapper or a rapper? You know, which one is it? A nice little five-page section on Lil Yachty, which is great. Um, I'm going to be teaching that, not in Atlanta. I'm going to be using that when I talk about the internet, how the internet works in hip hop, why Lil Yachty is different than Lil Baby. Um, again, more of this rapper trap, uh, Drake's feature on Yes Indeed. 
here's the thing I didn't know. I talk all the time about, about streaming bloat, right? And I, I call it Drake disease. But of course, Drake didn't invent it. Drake doesn't invent anything. That's not an insult. He's just very good at finding what other people do and making it more successful. So this, this whole bit here describes the album Culture 2 by Migos, which was intentionally bloated. The more tracks they put out, the more chances they had to happen upon a huge single. And because the way streams were counted on Billboard charts, long albums could also benefit at first with any combination of 1,500 streams counting as the equivalent of one album sold. The more tracks for fans to sample, the higher the total streams. So it was the Migos who were guilty of it after all. Interesting. Uh, but you'll notice that is in my internet and rap section because I'm going to be talking about the influence of internet and rap. One page on Lil Nas X, internet and rap. An Atlanta rapper who has nothing to do with this book. The stories that are in here have nothing to do with how Lil Nas X became so popular. That's what's fascinating. <laughs> he's, he's an Atlanta rapper who can talk about Atlanta, but he wasn't part of the Magic City. He wasn't part of the BFM. He wasn't a part of Coach K or Rico Wade or the Dungeon or anything. Um, there's an interesting bit here about Lil Baby's substance abuse. And at some point, I'm probably going to address this in the Atlanta section and I suppose the Houston section. Uh, but just, you know, talking about lean, talking about opioids and the addiction of opioids. I mean, part of hip hop history is the history of drugs, right? I mean, obviously the crack epidemic is after once rap was founded, I'd say the crap at <laughs> The crack epidemic was like the most important thing to happen outside of, uh, you know, out, outside of the music itself. But then beyond that, it's, just, it's fascinating to have all these rappers who rap about addictive substances. You know, like when when I was growing up, <laughs> rappers would rap about weed. And that was it. Sometimes they would do a little coke. They'd rap about doing a little coke. But it's interesting that especially with Atlanta rappers, the thing now is just to rap about being a total junkie. I mean, on his first song, on, on Lil Baby's first song, he talks about being a junkie. And so there's a nice little section here about his substance abuse and about the relationship that it has to music. God damn it. What am I going to do about Juice World? Am I going to put Juice World, 6 9 Lil Yachty, all in that one class on internet rap? God damn it. What am I going to do? It's okay. It's okay. A good class is a sculpture, okay? It's a sculpture made out of marble, not out of bronze, okay? When you make sculpture out of bronze, you got to make the mold, and then you're done. When you make a sculpture out of marble, it starts off as a brick, and you just chip away at it, okay? I'm trying to make, I'm trying to make David here, okay? Michelangelo's David, which, by the way, is the most amazing piece of art I've ever seen. It doesn't matter how many times you've seen images of David. When you go to Florence and you see the real thing in the museum, not outside, the one that's outside is a copy. It's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. That's what I'm trying to make as a class. Uh, then at the end, there's some discussion of the song Bigger Picture, which will be interesting because so much of the history of Atlanta rap is about non-political stuff, you know, the, the brands and just these things floating around. But with the song Bigger Picture being about Black Lives Matter, that is sort of at the end of the book. Right, so he talks about it on page uh, 336 uh, and the last page of new content on here is like page 371, okay? But also the very first thing he talks about in the introduction is bigger picture. So I'm gonna use that as a sort of way to close here. So th that's my take on this book. That's how I'm gonna use this book. I skipped over massive sections of this book, talking about Marlo, talking about Reek. Um, I did that because I don't have time. I just don't have time. I have to finish grading. My wonderful college is changing over its course management system. So I have to make sure all the files that I've been using for the past 12 years don't get erased. I love it. Um, I have to do Christmas shopping. <laughs> you know, I have to do all this stuff. So there are entire swaths of this, which as far as I can tell, are quite interesting. You know, Marlo being little baby's friend who died in a shootout. Um, you know, but I had to really focus on things I knew I was going to be teaching. And you have to pare things down. So Jermaine Dupree, who is pretty well explained in this book, 
even though he might be the most important person in the founding of hip hop in Atlanta, may only get a single sentence mention in my class. Maybe not even that. You have to choose. So, so depressing. Okay. Well then, tell me if that's interesting. Tell me what you think about Atlanta rap. What else do I need to teach? Uh, where were you when Big Meech brought the Tigers in? And uh, there's the camera. <laughs>